Welcome to our Bible study. We're looking at the book of Jude. I'm Jim Sloan, and this is coming through uh, Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Marion, Illinois. And we're going to take a look at just one verse today, verse 11. Uh, very important verse. In it, it talks about three famous sinners. And the people of Israel, uh, the people of the, the Jude's day among the Jewish people would have been very familiar with these people. And we're just going to take a little bit of time to be familiar with those today. Probably people you've heard of, maybe not know all the details, but we're going to take a little time with it and see how that applies to what Jude is telling uh, the people he's writing to that applies to us also. Before I go on, I want to remind you that Aldersgate is planning to have worship service at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, August the 9th, to resume their worship in their building. So we invite you to be a part of that, be praying for it, be, uh, be telling people about it. Follow the protocol very carefully. Uh, wonderful days. I, I get concerned in the churches I'm working with that we can't sing like we would like to. But it struck me just recently that as I was thinking about what God wants out of a church, while well, singing is very intrinsic to Christian worship and all that we are, there can come the time that we have to step away from it a little bit. And it seems to be the wisest thing to do in terms of just our health and the health of our community. But I think Matt Redman a few years ago that uh, was a worship leader that stepped away from a while from leading it and he wrote this song uh, I'm getting back to the heart of worship because it's all about you folks just the truth of it a lot of times the, the rituals the songs the things that we've done in worship the sermons and all we make them about ourselves rather than really about God and Jesus did say my house shall be called what a house of prayer for all people not a house of preaching or a house of singing or a house of liturgies and fellowship. My house should be called a house of prayer. I think there's a call in this day for us, uh, if I've learned anything through this pandemic about what the church ought to be doing, pray. That's the heart of what our ministry is to our Lord and Him communicating with us. So uh, emphasize that. Hope you'll take advantage of that. You'll be praying. Praying with the, the brothers and sisters. Great opportunity of fellowship and Great opportunities for worship. Well, we're going to look at this verse 11. Maybe I can read this and not make the kind of mistakes I did last time. I tried to read scripture to you, but it says in verse 11, the book of Jude, only one chapter long, this verse, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perish in the rebellion of Korah. Well, let you pray with me, please. Father, I need your help, I need your direction, I need you to carry this message through for us. And Lord, what I would say would be in line with your will, your scriptures, we want you to reveal yourself. God, we want to know this word, not for knowledge's sake, but for intimacy's sake with you and faithfulness to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, he starts this verse out by saying, Woe, woe to them. Woe is a classic form of the judgment of God. So what we had in verses 8, 9, 10 is a pronouncement of sinful behavior, things that the false prophets were doing, coming right out of the previous verses, that it talked about judgment upon Israel in the wilderness, the angels, and uh, then on Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, then these false prophets or false teachers and their followers are carrying on the same kind of thing. And he says, woe to them. Judgment has come upon them. And he is saying there is a certain future of judgment awaiting them. A certain future of judgment is awaiting them. Woe. That is used in the Old Testament over and over and over to announce the judgment of God. Numbers, Isaiah, yeah, Isaiah used it more than a dozen times. Jeremiah, 
Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Jesus does it. You say, well, you know, the Old Testament's got these woes, but New Testament, Jesus is like, folks, Jesus gives us more woes than the Old Testament does. And Jesus then, he says, woe to you, uh, Chorazin, and to Capernaum, and Bethsaida. A woe to uh, those uh, the, that are offended in the world. He said the world's going to bring offense, but he said, woe to the man who, by whom the offense comes. He says, woe to the scribes and Pharisees. He says that several times. Woe to them. They're hypocrites. Woe to the blind guiders, he says. Woe to the scribes and Pharisees, again, repeatedly, over and over. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. That's, a, that's one. And then we, we find that these strong statements are about woe to this one, woe to that one. Jesus makes it. Old Testament makes it. Over in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, it says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet that is going to come. And so he says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. You know, there are places in the Bible that it talks about woes, and it says, uh, Woe to us, or woe to me. Woe to me. And uh, there's times that it says, uh, Woe unto me, or woe uh, for us. Paul, though, he makes this statement, and this fits right in with what Jude is saying. He says, Woe to them, they're going to come under judgment. Paul, very aware of not maybe the situation exactly that Jude was talking about, but how this can come about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, he says, For I preach the gospel. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes. And then he says this one, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And these men were not preaching the gospel. They may have been talking a lot of religious talk. They could have been talking doctrine. They could even talk about Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, those things. But they were not proclaiming the gospel. In fact, there's a lot of people today that can talk a whole lot about the Bible, but they still don't preach the gospel. Their emphasis is not upon what Paul points out as the gospel in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians that, you know, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried third day he was raised from the dead, raised into life according to scripture. He has appeared. The kind of things through this Bible that talks about the kingdom of God coming through the cross of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, his power, his ascension, his reigning over all things, that gospel message, the good news that God has given us. It's, and Paul says, woe is me if I, not if I don't preach, but if I don't preach the gospel. These people we're not preaching the gospel. So woe had come upon them. The woes will come upon us. Judgment comes if we don't. Now, the fate of these false teachers is going to be similar to three people that Jude points out. As I said earlier, these are three people that were very familiar to the Jewish people. They uh, I talked about them often in rabbinical writings, other writings. They appear several times in scriptures, actually. Uh, particularly Balaam does a few times, and Cain does. But uh, he points out three. In the first one, he says, here's what these false teachers have done. They have gone in the way of Cain. They have gone in the way of Cain. You remember who Cain was? Cain was the first child of Adam and Eve. Eve conceived. She brings forth this child, Cain. She says, I've got a man. God has given me a man. Name him Cain. Cain became a uh, farmer. He tilled the fields. He raised crops. Because it tells us in the fourth chapter of Genesis that there came a time that he brought from his fields things that he had grown and made an offering to the Lord. His younger brother, Abel, who's the second born, he comes as a shepherd, and he brought a sacrifice from his flock and gave it. God was pleased with the offering of Abel, but rejected 
the offering of Cain, which made Cain angry. It says his countenance fell. He was angry. He turned his jealousy on his brother, and God spoke to him. And I want you to be very clear about something as that fourth chapter of Genesis, the seventh verse, about Cain. Cain became angry because God said, no, I want you to give a blood sacrifice. That's what it amounted to. Not something that you've raised out of your hands, but something that you know, is, is, is really not of your doing. But uh, this, this making him angry, and God spoke to him, and he says to him, in fact, he says, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? It's not about your work salvation, but if you give the right sacrifice, it'll be accepted. He says, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. You must should rule over it. What he says to Cain is very clear. He says, Cain, you're in danger. Your anger, your jealousy, your disappointment, and not having an acceptable sacrifice and turning it towards your brother, he said, you be very careful because that attitude in you is sin lying at your door and it desires to take you and you need to rule over it. Folks, there's a lot of times that we just let sin take over in our lives and it wants, to, it wants us to destroy us. And we need to be very clear we need to take that before the Lord. And God warned Cain very clearly. Cain, you're in danger. You're in danger. Well, what did Cain do about it? I said he, he talked with his brother, Aaron, or Abel, rather. He talked with his brother, Abel, getting ahead of myself in the story. And it came to pass, it says, while they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. And uh, then we go on, hit, you know, God says, where's your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? Is that my responsibility? Well, the truth is, it is our responsibility to look out for one another. But God brought judgment upon Cain. And Cain then becomes, in Jewish history, they considered him the first heretic. They considered him the one who turned his back on God, in a sense. He was a traitor. And what do we have within him? We've got these things. Hate, anger, jealousy, murder, self-centeredness. They're all in Cain. And Cain chose, remember that verse 7 now, Cain chose wickedness rather than the goodness of God. He chose that way by just his rejection. First John, uh, third chapter, he talks about Cain who was the wicked one that murdered his brother. And... Uh, he did it because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. One of the things he's saying here is be very careful when we're jealous of righteous people. That kind of attitude, that murdering attitude, don't go there. And he said, these false teachers are getting like Cain. Watch, particularly in your Christian work, watch the jealousies. Watch it when you think somebody else gets a favor from God that you don't get. Be very careful about that. Sin's lying at the door. It desires you. You need to step over that. Don't, don't step into that trap. Be careful about that. Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Trust him with that. The second one he talks about is Balaam. Balaam is um, talked about a lot of times in Scripture. Peter talks about Balaam. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, he says... Look, he said, Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Micah talks about him as uh, one that uh, had gone astray and led the people of Israel astray. Um, Book of Revelation, the church of Pergamos. Jesus speaks to them and says, uh, you're following the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak, that was the king of the Moabites, and we'll talk about that in a minute, to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat such things as were sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. He said, you've led the people into sin. And uh, 
the story is in Numbers 2, uh, let's see, Numbers 22, 23, 24. And let me tell it rather briefly. We'll try to get to it here. Um, the children of Israel are moving through the wilderness, is about to move into the land of Canaan. And they are there on that west side of the Jordan and the Dead Sea. They're in the area of Moab. Moab is the area down the Ammonites and the Moabites were over in that eastern side of the Jordan. And the king of the Moabites was a man by the name of uh, Balak. Balak sees this vast number of uh, the children of Israel that encamped on that side, saw how large they were, and he also realized that he did not have an army large enough to defeat them. And he had heard about them, what had happened with them and the Ammonites and others before the Amorites, and he's, he's heard about them. They're, there's fear among the people of Moab, of these children of Israel, because they would sweep in and take over. And now you've got to remember, they're ready to go in, and so we've got that younger group that had, had been spared uh, out of the wilderness, the ones that were 20 and younger, plus the families of uh, Caleb and Joshua, that uh, when they come to Beersheba and did not go on and take the land, there had been at 40 years they had will, the wilderness journeys, and now they're ready to take it, and they're strong and capable of taking it. And so Balak calls upon a prophet. He knows of a prophet by the name of Balaam, who is a famous and a powerful prophet. So he sends some um, delegation over to him with money, a fee. And he says to Balaam, we want you to come and put a curse on these Israelites. Well, Balaam says, let me think about it overnight and we'll go tomorrow. And so he thinks about it. He says to these guys, he says, I can't do it. It wasn't a moral issue with him. He says, I can't do it. God will, I, I cannot pronounce a curse on him. God does not allow it. I'm not capable of doing it. Whatever blessings and curses he was able to give had to come from a divine power. And he said, I can't, I can't do it. And it's, it's kind of like you almost get the idea, said, I'd love to do it, guys, but I, I just am not, I can't. I don't have the capability. Well, they went back and they told Balak what happened and he sent uh, a more prestigious group, princes with it. They go and they take a greater reward and they say to Balaam, we want you to come put a curse on these Israelites. Balaam says, oh, guys, I can't do it. I can't go with you. God's, God's got favor on him, and he won't let me do it. I, if you give me the whole palace, which, by the way, would probably be a good idea. I'd love to have that. But no, he said, if you give me the whole thing, I couldn't put the curse on it. Well, they, they start to go back, and he prays about it and asks, and he says, well, maybe I could go with you. Maybe I can just go with you and explain this to Balak. Well, God evidently, it's a little confusing there, but God says you can go. But as he takes off, he's riding his donkey. It's a female donkey he's had for a good while. And that donkey sees a angel with a sword drawn standing in a way and goes off the side. Balak beats that donkey. Beats that donkey. Well, he gets it to go on, they go a little bit further, and they get to another more narrow place. And there again, that donkey sees this angel of God with the sword drawn, ready to strike him down. And he goes against a wall that is there. And it crushes, I don't know how badly, but it crushes, it hurts at least, Balaam's foot. And he beats his donkey again. Well, they go a little bit farther, and this time... They come to a narrow place and there isn't any wall to go against, there isn't any ridge to go down, and the donkey sees the angel of God with the sword drawn again, and the donkey laid down in the road. And Balaam gets off and beat his donkey. You know this story? And then the donkey said, what are you beating me for? <laughs> the donkey takes on the voice of a human being and talks. What are you be beating me for? I've been your I've been faithful to you for a long time. I've carried you. 
I'm just trying to save your life, essentially, is what it says. And then his eyes are open, and he sees that angel there with the sword. But they get on, he gets up, and he tries to uh, work things with Balak, and he says, I can't do it. Balak gives him another shot at it, and they, they do things like, we'll go and we'll see him from a distance. This is not like, this isn't going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat, Balaam. We're going to drop a bomb on him from 30,000 feet or more. Can you do that? Well, maybe we can. And he gets there and says, I can't do it. God won't let me. I don't care how much you pay me. I can't do it. Well, maybe if we just see part of him. So he take him to another place. And he still couldn't do it. And he takes a third place to do it. And he still can't do it. He has all these oracles that he tries to go. And he can't pronounce the curse because God won't do it. And the Bible makes this point several times then. It says when he wanted to curse him, God made it a blessing. When he wanted to curse, God made it a blessing. Well, Balaam, although he was willing to do it for the money, willing to do it for the reward, he could not do it. And he goes back seemingly a failure. Except there's one thing, and it kind of gets obscured in that story, but there's one thing that we pick up as we read on through the scripture. And that is this, that he tells Balak, I can't put a curse on him. But he said, I'll tell you what you could do. God wants them to stay pure. You could run your women out there. You could run, get your best looking women of the Moabites and seduce the men of Israel and God will bring judgment upon them. And that happened. It didn't happen in the extensive way that Balak wanted, but it did happen. And so Balaam, for his treachery, brought in the way to weaken the children of Israel through the immorality. And that kind of theme is brought up here again. And he says, I want you to remember what happened to Balaam. And so this is a prophet for pay, though. That more than anything, the emphasis is put here, because he says it here and it's made other places in Scripture, that Balaam ran greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. There's plenty in the Bible to tell us, watch out for the people who trade in the Bible, the gospel, and they're looking for the profit. Never do it for greed. We don't, we gotta watch our anger, we gotta watch our self-righteousness, we've gotta watch those things of Cain, but we also need to watch that with Balaam where we're trading in the gospel, working it for the money, do for the reward, even to the place he said, I can't, listen, Balaam says, I can't preach error, I can't, I can't get by with it. But he still was trying to figure out how he could get the reward, how he could get the money. And so he goes down as this uh, example of false teacher propagating an error in order to make money. He says, always watch that, watch that. And uh, that's something that's very deceitful to us today. Uh, we need to pay close attention to what Jesus said about the rich. It, it's a serious matter. And most all of us think, well, I can be rich and not fall into that. I can do it and not fall into it. Uh, be careful. And be careful particularly if you're working the word of the Lord. Third one he talks about is Korah. Korah is probably the least known of these three. And I'm sure he is. Korah's story is in Numbers chapter 16. And what we find there, he's uh, talked about a few other times. What we find is that he leads a rebellion against Moses. And Aaron. Moses and Aaron are leading the children of Israel through the wilderness. Korah is a Levite. But listen to some things that he says. I'm going to read the first three verses in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 16. I will not read the whole chapter. You ought to read it. It's a good chapter to read. Interesting. He says, Now Korah, the son of Isha, uh, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and... Uh, Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the sons of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, 
And they rose up before Moses, and this is where we get to moving now, rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? What they've done is come to Moses and Aaron and say, Moses, we're tired of you running everything. We think we ought to be running it. And we think that the whole congregation ought to be in that. There's always these people like Korah who is really wanting the power himself and he tries to get these people that he's come up with. There's always a bunch of disgruntled people around any congregation. And he tries to pull them in on his side. Go to Moses and say, Moses, you just... You, you, you're just lorded it over too much. You're too much in charge. He himself now, Korah was a Levite. Moses' response to him was, we're doing what the Lord's told us to do. And God had put Moses and Aaron in charge. Moses was to be the priest. Korah was a Levite. Now, a Levite had responsibilities in leading the congregation in worship, but he wasn't a priest. But Moses says to him, says, why are you not satisfied with what God called you to do? You're, you've got a very important role to play. God has a place for you. Be satisfied. Be delighted, in fact, in the place that you have. This goes back to something like the angels. Stay in your place. What has God given you to do? Do that. Don't be jealous of somebody else's position or somebody else's gifts or somebody else's attention. God is going to work all of that out. You be faithful in what God's called you to do. But Korah and his buddies decided that they wanted to take over the power. And as you go on through this story, it says, God says, okay, well, you know, speaks with Moses and Moses comes before the Lord and says, okay, we're going to have a showdown. And he tells Korah and his 250 men and those leaders there uh, that uh, they uh, would come before the tabernacle of the Lord, bring their censers, and God is going to uh, reveal himself to who is really his people. Well, to get through the story quickly, they're rebelling, they're trying to take over the power, they're disrespectful for Aaron and for Moses, the leaders that God had placed there, the ones that God was giving a word through, the ones to give the direction. And they bring it up, you know, that you got too much power, you're too arrogant, you're taking too much on yourself, all of those kind of excuses. You've heard them before. We, the whole congregation, we're holy, we're wise, going against God's designated leadership and the way he put it up, put it together. And so they go before him and Moses says to all the people, all the congregation of Israel, they're all gathered around to see what's going to happen. He says, you better get away from Korah. Get away from Dathan and Abiram and all of these people that are with them. You better get back. He says, and you watch. If they are to die naturally, God's with them. But if there's a catastrophic death here, God's going to take care of it. And you know what happens there? At that point, the earth opened up and it swallowed them and their families. And then this 250, the ones that were left out of that, they kept all running. I mean, the earth swallowed them up. It just opened up. They fell into the pit, it says. And then these others take off running that had their centers and fire came out of heaven and burnt them up. And there's this cleansing and judgment. Very traumatic and very catastrophic scene in ancient Israel in the wilderness. I, it's been years since I've seen the movie uh, The Ten Commandments, but I think they, they portray that in that. If I remember right, at least one of these guys is played by Edward G. Robinson, which made it work really pretty well. He did it. I, I just kind of, I don't remember a lot of that movie, but I remember that, that he played that part. Well, what it is, is God saying, look, you've got to pay attention to the authorities that I set out. And to reject that and go against it. Folks, that's a very dangerous thing. It's very dangerous. And these false teachers were doing that. You know, 
don't touch the Lord's anointed is given us a scripture. Now, we preachers, and uh, we got to be careful that we don't use that for our own advantage and our own ego. We got to be very careful. Moses and all of the things we read about Moses, I want you to remember this. It's said of him in the scripture, he was the most humble man around. He was the most humble man in his generation. Stated by God, the most humble man in his generation. He was also the man of great power and leadership. And God had put him in that position. God put Aaron in that. And when they tried to rebel against it, what happens? These followers of Korah and that rebellion, they are destroyed. And God is saying in this to these people, you watch it. You watch it. Because like Cain, if you give in to the wickedness, like Baal, Balaam, rather, if you give in to the greed, even though you try to say, well, you know, I'm trying to do what the Lord told me, but giving in to the greed, in like Korah, that if you give in to that desire for power and authority and, and, and be jealous of the position that other people have, if you do that, judgment falls upon you too. And so he says, this is where the false prophets are. This is where the false teachers are. And those things that happen to these people, remember the example of those. Watch it. Watch it. Watch for those things in your own life. Particularly if you're in any kind of position of Christian teaching and leadership. Watch it. For those who are war you're listening to, watch it. That these things don't become what motivates and moves us. Well, thank you for your watching and thank you for your Bible study. I hope this is helpful to go through. We're going to get to some real positive stuff, but... Folks, these are days, let me assure you, these are days we need to be aware of the false teachers that are around us and what motivates them and how to stay away from them. God bless you.